Well, thanks, Tim, uh, and hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be speaking to you today. Um, as you can see by my attire, I'm actually sitting on site at Avery Nickel Mine right now. And in fact, if you look at the picture on your screen there, I'm at the very far right hand end of the in the building at the front there. So that's uh, precisely where I'm sitting. And so allow me to introduce you to Avery. What you see on the screen is a picture of what I think a modern critical minerals mine in Tasmania should look like. Uh, Avery is located about three kilometres inland from the west coast of Tasmania near Trial Harbour. And if you look at the top left of the image, um, you can actually see the sea. So you can see how close we are. And besides the portal and a couple of vent fans, what you see on the photograph there is pretty much the entire site complex. Um, so that's Avery in a single frame. It's small, it's clean, it's complete and it's productive. It produces battery grade nickel sulphide and it's powered by hydroelectricity. So Avery makes Maui Australia's next nickel sulphide producer with the opportunity to make our nickel as green as we want to. Uh, next slide, please. And over one more. So Avery is a rarity and because of Avery, Mali is the world's only pure play nickel sulphide company with its production from a tier one jurisdiction powered by predominantly green power. So that's as we understand it, we know of no others. And the case for Avery is utterly compelling. 29.3 million tonnes of Jork 2012 resource with over a quarter of a million tonnes of nickel in the ground, one of the largest nickel sulphide deposits in Australia at this point in time. And of course, it's not just any nickel, it is nickel sulphide, pentlandite. They call it class one nickel, and it's the nickel that is used to make battery products. And Tasmania, of course, is one of the most stable, well-regulated and well-serviced mining jurisdictions in the world. And our location on the West Coast offers accommodation, services, clean grid power, good transport links, a supportive community in which to live and operate our business. We have hydro power to the mine gate and a sealed road to the door and a town nearby to accommodate our workforce. Um, so it's a pretty special location. Thank you. The corporate picture is pretty simple for us at this point in time. We have 300 million shares on issue. We're raising capital right now. We're out live in the market with a prospectus. We're raising at 70 cents and we aim to raise perhaps as much as $70 million to get the mine moving, buy the fleet, expand the mine and explore for more apiaries. Hartree Metals, as you can see on the donut there, is our largest shareholder. They're a metals trader. They're backed by Hartree Partners in the US and then in turn above them by Oak Tree Capital, one, one of the largest uh, US private equity funds. Uh, so we've got a pretty good pedigree going back up the tree. Uh, looking to the right hand side of the slide, the directors are well experienced. Um, we've been together for quite some time now. Jeff's a geologist, Rowan is an accountant, Paul's a metallurgist and Steve is a trader and financier. Uh, but to introduce myself, uh, my background's in mine technical services, but I guess I'd describe myself as a specialist in mine management. And I can tell you that on New Year's Day next year, it's going to be 35 years since I first started work in the industry. So I've led numerous mines, including this one, once upon a time in the past, and I've decided to pull the boots back on to make sure that the restart goes well. So I'm a little different to most MDs that you might meet. I'm very hands-on. I'm fully committed to personally leading the restart of this mine. I've got great knowledge of the asset. And if I'm honest, a little bit of a following in Tasmania. Uh, and that's why we're able to recruit great people and make such a quick start, uh, which has been to our advantage. Thank you. So the case for nickel is very clear. As well as its traditional uses in various alloys and, and most notably stainless steel, nickel is used these days in batteries because it increases the energy density. So put simply, the battery lasts longer and so your electric vehicle has greater range. And of course, the world has made its decision and there is no stepping back from it. Globally, we are decarbonising. We need battery grade nickel to do that and there isn't enough. It's as simple as that. Manufacturers are scrambling to lock in supplies of high ESG low carbon, conflict free, and I guess you could perhaps read Russian free there, nickel sulphide. In other words, the nickel sulphide that we make at Avery. It's estimated that we are 60 mines short of being able to make enough nickel by the end of this decade. Now that's according to the IEA, uh, the International Energy Association. 
And of course, the Samsungs and the Volkswagens and the Teslas of the world are going to want our low carbon nickel sulfide for their batteries. So it's a pretty exciting commodity to be in right now. Thank you. With that said, ESG is really important to us. Um, simply put, ESG is about operating the right way. It actually comes naturally to us. And in Tasmania, and in Avebury in particular, we have many advantages. Uh, to begin with, 100% certified renewable grid power already in Tasmania. And the state is on its way to 200% renewable. To compare that to the national target of net zero by 2050 that we've set uh, in Canberra uh, just the other day, uh, Tasmania is streets ahead. The site itself is compact, as you saw, fully permitted tailings facility, and I'm delighted to say that future disposal of tailings and waste rock will be underground. The discharge water, naturally slightly alkaline. Uh, we've put a lot of work into establishing wetlands to make sure that it's clean. And of course, we're focused on safety, being a good corporate citizen and being a responsible large local employer. We follow the ICMM's mining principles and we've adopted a formal reporting framework for ESG and in particular for carbon. So you can expect to see a formal ESG report early next year and, and then annually thereafter. If you could turn the slide, please. So I'd like to turn briefly now to the resource. Uh, you can see it here in long section, coloured for nickel uh, and showing the drilling to date. And a couple of things stand out. It's been mostly drilled from surface. There's been very little below 400 metres. And so you can see the deposit, which forms into these large sort of lobes uh, perhaps 600 metres long, up to 60 metres wide. Um, and you can see they, they tend to stop where the drilling stops. So in each case, they're open at depth um, below, the, below the depth uh, of the drilling today. So it's pretty exciting uh, from that perspective. Uh, you can also see the mine's quite compact. So that 400 metre uh, depth has got the 30 odd million tonnes of resource in it. So very high tonnes per vertical metre very large stopes, that makes for very efficient mining, means that the haul distances are short. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite an efficient mine. Um, East Avebury, you can see there on the right-hand side of the slide, it outcrops on surface. I think that could be an open pit in the future. And then of course, we've got many years ahead of us on just the known deposit before we start stepping out and around that. You can see on the slide, the mine is accessed in the center where the Avebury and the Viking ore bodies meet. Um, and there are two years of levels already accessed below the lowest stoping level in the mine at this point in time. So it's well set up to be kickstarted into operation. Thank you. The underground mine, well established, 8.5 kilometres of development is in place. Ventilation, pumping, electrical and escapeway infrastructure is all good. It's all in place, it's all installed. It's all up uh, to a good standard for operation. Three main loads, uh, all accessed from existing development, which is developed two years ahead of the stoping front. And the mine's shallow. It's only a 1.8 kilometre drive from the very bottom of the mine to the portal at this point in time. And yet in that depth, there is two years of production that's already been accessed. And that's pretty exciting because that means this mine is ideal for battery electric machines. We're already working with manufacturers and it's a very exciting move. We're aiming to fully decarbonise the mine in the longer run. Our forward plan includes buying our first fully electric underground machine inside this financial year. So we're that close. And that's partly because the geometry of the mine lends itself even to the current technology that's available now. The ground is competent. The water, as I said, is alkaline and non-corrosive. And in short, the mine is immaculate. If you could turn over, please. If the mine's immaculate, the processing plant is pristine. It ran for nine months. They didn't even wear the paint off it and it closed during the global financial crisis. Uh, most of the plant's undercover. It's been well cared for during those years of care and maintenance. Um, we're four and a half months now into a six month refurbishment plant. Uh, by the time that's done, we'll have commissioning stocks of about 50,000 tonnes sitting on the ROM pad ready to go. So nameplate capacity for Avebury, uh, 900,000 tonnes per annum, uh, recovering 79% of the nickel, 20% concentrate. And the plant was designed to be expanded up to 1.8 million tonnes per annum, but I can tell you my work uh, during uh, my time here in the past showed that probably 1.2 million is, is optimum. And so we've included capital to achieve that in our $70 million target raise. 
uh, reagent storage and mixing and the delivery system, one of the best I've ever seen. Tailings dam is fully permitted. Uh, this place is ready to run. Thank you. I'll turn briefly to exploration. We have two packages of tenements that we're working on. So uh, out to the west, so the left-hand one there around Avebury, um, the Avebury Arc, it refers to the edge of the ultramafic host that curves from Avebury towards Trial Harbour on the coast, just where the Heemskirk granite then dives underneath. And we think there's potential for many Averys in that district. And of course, we've only found one so far. Um, so that's a pretty exciting area for exploration to find more Averys. And then something a little different at Melba, which is about 20 kilometres away um, up the road, we're really excited to follow up the high grade historical production that was there, nickel, copper, platinum group metals. Uh, we've acquired another tenement uh, because the, uh, the little ring of historical mines that was there um, prior to the 1960s kind of tracks the edge of the anomaly. Of course, the old timers didn't know anything about anomalies and so they were just where they found the, uh, the metal. We've acquired the rest of that, so that's very, very exciting. Uh, we're going to do a lot of exploration there in the uh, in the coming months and years. Thank you. I want to just turn to the picture going forward. Uh, we have milestones planned immediately following the completion of the capital raise. So timing on the current raise, uh, we are open until the 19th of August, and thereafter we'll be working with the ASX to return to uh, to trading, and we're hoping that will happen somewhere around about the back end of the month. Uh, so in the meantime, we'll be producing uh, from the Stokes. The underground mine is running already. A Stoke production will be in production by the end of this month. I've got two brand new tele-remote loaders um, that have arrived in Tasmania. In fact, there was a picture of them in the local paper this morning. Uh, we'll have 50,000 tonnes of ore on the stockpile by mid-September, and then we will restart the plant. And meanwhile, of course, as I said, the capital raising is going on, the shares return to trade. Um, and immediately after that happens, you then have this series of highly positive production milestones lined up. So you hit first production, you have your first sales and your first revenue not long after that. Um, then we get to the half year report, which of course this time around we'll be talking about a full quarter of production with all of our physicals and our costs and our revenue. So that'll be demonstrating uh, that we are a true producer. We'll aim to hit that 900,000 tonne per annum mark early in the new year. Of course, we'll be declaring a reserve and then exploration outcomes as we go along that aren't shown on this slide, but, but they're on top as well. So there's an awful lot coming at us down the pipeline in uh, not a very uh, long space of time uh, at all. Thank you, if you'd like to, to turn over. So I've just got a couple of pages of pictures really from site now. Uh, people say to me, is it really happening, John? And I say, absolutely it is, but here's the proof if you want to see it. So some of our, uh, our people at work, uh, we have now over 100 people on site heading towards a, a target in the end of 200 employees uh, when we're at full noise. So you can see the jumbo on the left there, that's drilling the first cut at Avery in 13 years. Uh, that was a pretty exciting day. Uh, on the lower right, you can see our mine rescue team on their first day of training, and they're uh, really committed. And I'm, uh, I'm always pleased to, to see mine rescue teams. I'm a big supporter of mine rescue in, uh, in mines. If you want to go over the page um, for the last one, uh, there's some of our fleet at work uh, at the moment. Uh, that uh, picture on the right was the first truck of ore leaving the Avery portal in 13 years. Uh, that was a very exciting day for people on site uh, too, uh, I can tell you. Uh, and that's it. You can perhaps go over to the end slide and, uh, and uh, Tim, I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, um, a very exciting story, John, um, and quite a few questions. Can we go back a step and you, can you tell us, um, A, why the mine closed and you talk about restarting. Can you give us some kind of historical background here? Yeah, look, it was all a little bit unfortunate, actually, um, uh, why, why it closed. It ran uh, very briefly in, in the global financial crisis. So, um, it was uh, it was it was opened by Oz Minerals, but Oz Minerals had its own problems and was unable to financially support the mine uh, during that critical startup phase. Uh, the price fell away during that period, um, and a number of shortcuts had been made. A number of a number of items, things like the site laboratory, which is pretty handy to know what's going through your processing plant, that had been deleted from the spec and it wasn't built. Um, so while they were operating in that difficult climate. Uh, they, were, they were kind of running blind. And um, so a series of, of problems with the way the, 
uh, really corporate failings in the way um, the company was set up. And um, I, you know, I know a number of people who worked here at that time. We have some of them working for us here with us now, and um, they are just loving the chance to get back and do it properly this time around. And and can you give us a little bit? I think you've understated your background here. Um, I know a couple of brokers speak very fondly of you. Can you give us a, a, a more insight into your background and kind of what excites you about this project? <laughs> yeah, look, I've been I've been around a while, as I said. Um, I was um, general manager of Century uh, for a while, so Century Zinc in uh, in Queensland. Uh, had a wonderful time up there, a very large site, um, you know, as, as perhaps as people will know. I was general manager of the Rosebury Mine, which is a, an 85-year-old uh, underground mine just up the road from here. Um, interesting comparison between Avery and, and Rosebury. So the, the tonnage each year will be around about the same. Rosebury is a very deep, very old mine. So you think of a workforce of 500 people and, ten, and a fleet of 10 trucks. Over at Avery, 200 people and four trucks does the same time. It just gives you a comparison of, of how, what the benefit is of being you know, large tonnage close to surface. Um, so those two are my sort of favourite operating mines. Uh, I've spent many years um, uh, in and around uh, Tasmania. As I say, I'm coming up on 35 years um, uh, at the end of uh, the end of this year. Uh, ran a civil construction company at one point um, and a, uh, a heavy haulage company. So um, probably some good experience I can uh, I can put to use here. And and you spoke about Rosebury. Can you give us an idea of kind of valuations there and, and any other kind of peer comparisons that are in the market? Yeah. So um, people people do say to me, well, how do you, um, you know, how do you, how do you value? Um, you know, and, and we're talking around our, our seventy cent share price. Now we we price that. Um, to go. We have said um, that's a great number for our existing shareholders because it's more or less a wash for them. We have about 3,000 small shareholders in the company. Um, our shares have been suspended for a little while now, having come out of the, uh, you know, the issues we had uh, in Myanmar and everybody would understand uh, what happened over there. Um, so we wanted to make sure their value was protected, but at the same time, you want plenty of upside in the price for an incoming shareholder and, and an existing shareholder too, for that matter. Um, so, you know, what I would do if I were looking to, to get some valuation, I'd be going out to the peer group and I'd, I'd say for nickel sulphide producers in Australia, the peer group's pretty small. Um, so you're looking at Panoramic, you're looking at Mincor. Um, you can do a calculation then of EV, um, market cap being a rough proxy for that, but EV per tonne of nickel in their resources. Um, if you do that calculation for us, you get $847 per tonne of nickel contained in the resource. Um, people can do the calculation for the peer group for themselves, but you'll find that there is plenty of value upside in that 70 cent share price. And, and that's entirely deliberate. You know, we need this thing to be successful. I want the dollars to, to invest into the mine. Uh, I want to expand this mine. I want to explore it. I want to turn it into a mine for the future that produces the battery grade nickel and produces it in a low carbon way, uh, which we can do uniquely from Tasmania. Uh, but I want the capital raise to be successful, um, hence the pricing. And, and John, a couple more questions, if you don't mind. Now, arsenic was historically a, a kind of raised as a concern on the project. Can you give us a bit more colour on that, given yeah. your ESG credentials? Absolutely. Look, arsenic was a bit of a furphy, to be honest. Um, it does exist in the ore body. Uh, geologically fairly low, 200, 300 parts per million. Um, challenge in the past when this mine ran, um, the work had not been done to determine where the arsenic was in the ore body. So you need to do what I call big company drilling and assaying, you need to build a geometallurgical model of the ore body um, so that you can actually use that as a planning tool. Now, that work was done post-closure. So I actually arrived, I was general manager here um, while I was at Rosebury. Uh, I oversaw that drilling work, built up that body of knowledge. We have a beautiful geometallurgical model of the ore body now. So a block model, if you like, for arsenic. We know where it is and we know where it isn't. Um, we can plan around that. Uh, and we have a full detailed budget mine design, stoke design, scheduled out, put through the, the, the processing model. Uh, and I can tell you that arsenic is a, is a non-issue uh, in, our, in our output product. The other thing that was a problem in the past was the nature of the offtake agreement to sell the product demanded a very, very high grade and it could only go into China. And of course, they ran into trouble with more arsenic than they expected because they didn't know where it was concentrated up to very high levels because of the offtake specification, and then they couldn't sell it at times to their only customer uh, because of China's stringent import limit. 
we have a completely different arrangement. Our off taker is Hartree, they're a trader. They'll sell the product anywhere, very flexible on grade, high payability, all the way down to 10% nickel and concentrate. And I can tell you after decades of mine managing, uh, your best friend is flexibility. And if you've got flexibility, room on commercial terms and product specs and uh, all of those things, then um, you can deal with you know, issues like impurities in your, in your ore uh, just disappear. So it's, a, it's really a non-issue um, these days. To be honest, if it was ever an issue, I think it was uh, the scapegoat for what I believe was a corporate failing. Understood. Now, let's, let's finish on the offer. Um, you're looking to raise somewhere between 20 and 70 million. I mean, that's a big range there. What, what does that allow you to do or, and not to do if, if you're not successful at the top of the range? Uh, it, it is a big range. Um, and, you know, fixed price. Um, and, and, and therefore, we went for some flex on, on the range. Uh, at the low end, that is enough money to get the mine going. So it pays for those things that I mentioned, like the laboratory, for example, that were deleted in the past and need to be built now, um, gets the mine up and running and, and, and operating. Uh, at the big end of the range, though, I've got money in there for a high impact exploration program. That's really exciting. So that's underground exploration to expand the ore body, exploration on the Avery Arc to find more Averys and exploration over at Melbourne to find some high grade. Um, so that's really exciting. The large end of the raise has also got capital in there to expand, to expand the mine. So I, I want to go up to that 1.2 million that um, I understand to be optimum. Um, so there's money in there for extra mobile equipment. There's money in there for plant expansions where you need an extra filter press to produce the concentrate and, and some other things in the processing plant. So that is, that's, that is uh, the funding we need to take Avery to where it should be, optimised, productive, uh, we've turned our mind, therefore, to moving to the electric equipment uh, and it's a mind for the future. John, thanks for your time. I know I'm going to get lots of inquiries about this in terms of how investors can get access. So uh, I'll give you a buzz during the week if you don't mind. Yep, people don't want to miss out. Now's the time to get into nickel and now's the time to get into this one. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, John.